Hey, Melanie, thanks for joining us on the Zora Talks podcast. Thank you for having me. So this conversation has been a long time coming. I remember, I think I met you when you were first launching Papaloo. Back in the early days. Yeah. So look, look at us now. So yeah, a couple, a couple of years ago, it was nice, uh, nice to keep in touch this whole time. I know. So I'm going to kick off the podcast and I want to ask you if you can tell us something interesting about yourself that no one knows. Or most people know. <laughs> something interesting about me that no one knows. Boy, that's a good one. Well, everyone always asks, you know, they hear this really bizarre accent. They say, where are you from? Some people say Canadian. Some I've gotten South African, all sorts of all sorts of uh, Commonwealth countries. But I was born and raised in London. So I've got a very bizarre accent and it's uh, mostly gone. But every now and then you'll hear it. You'll be like, what? What is that that I'm hearing? So. Wow. That's something I didn't know. <laughs> so thanks for sharing that. Yeah. <laughs> I would have I would have guessed New York, I think. <laughs> um, I get that too. I don't understand why that happens. I can't think of yeah, people people say New York sometimes. I I don't know why. So, um, can you tell us a little bit about your background? I know that you had a life before Papaloo, so we would love to hear about it. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, so but my 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 career has has really been in consumer packaged goods, which we call CPG. All the, a lot of the big companies with the brands that we all grew up with, like stovetop stuffing and macaroni and cheese and DiGiorno pizza and uh, all those big brands. And then I had an amazing opportunity to create and nationally launch the Fairlife dairy brand. Uh, Fairlife later exited to Coca Cola, so that was um, an amazing experience. Um, and that led me into entrepreneurship. I thought, well, I need the next challenge. The next challenge is doing it on my own. So I launched into Poppyloo back in 2017 and have been growing the business ever since, learning tremendously along the way. Some things that worked, some things that didn't, and pivoting and refining as we go along. So now this is our, our best year ever, I'm happy to say. And uh, hopefully this is the sign of, of the next wave of our business. Wow, that's great. And so you said it's the best year ever. How long have you been running Poppyloo? Well, so we started in 2017. So um, we started with bottled lemonades uh, that were high in antioxidants. And we'd always had in our sights the idea to do a kid's beverage or kid's lemonade pouch. So last year, I decided to go ahead and launch it with Walmart. Uh, and I wanted to see how it did. And it's done so well that I decided to put the bottles on the back burner, given that this is a startup and we have lean resources. So I want to focus just on the pouches for now, see where that goes, and then hopefully reintroduce the bottles again later. Okay. And so we know a little bit about the life of Papaloo, but I, I would love for you to give us an overview in case our listeners don't know about it yet. Um, so Poppy Lou started back in 2017 when I was pregnant, craving citrus, and I couldn't satisfy that citrus craving with anything on the market. So I set out to create a line of healthy lemonades to maximize citrus refreshment for the mainstream consumer, not really the foodie elite. And I named it Poppy Lou after my daughter. Her name is Poppy, and she's the one who gave me the, the citrus craving during that pregnancy. So we started with a line of bottled lemonades, super high in antioxidants, a really tart and tangy flavor profile in flavors like passion fruit and blueberry lavender. Amazing product. And it did fine, but we always had in our sights to do a kid's um, a lemonade pouch. Uh, kind of like a Capri Sun, only healthier and more contemporary for in a way that speaks to uh, the modern mom as opposed to the moms of um, of the 1980s. And so I uh, launched the kids' pouches last year. Uh, we launched in Walmart, and this year we've expanded to about 2,500 stores. And super excited about the prospect of of the pouches. Uh, and hopefully we'll get to reintroduce those bottles again. But right now, with limited resources as a startup, I really wanted to focus on the pouches since that's a really exciting part of the business right now. Yeah, I was really excited to try the pouches this weekend, like I was telling you earlier. And I liked it in the fact that it said it had 100% of the daily value for your vitamin C. And the other thing I loved it is that it wasn't too sweet. So can you tell us about the health benefits of the product? Yep. So they are organic. They have no added refined sugar. They have the lowest sugar of any kid's juice 
pouch that, that or juice box or juice pouch that I know of. Um, in fact, so we're at seven grams of sugar and that sugar comes naturally from the fruit juice itself. So it ends up just being a healthier, a healthier beverage option and um, 100 percent daily value of vitamin C, as you pointed out. So, you know, the goal is to give uh, give the consumer really great flavor without a lot of sugar. Uh, we say bold on flavor, not on sugar or bold on citrus, not on sugar and uh, and just a, a healthy alternative to traditional juices. But I think you know, there, there has been so many, so many flavored water entrants in the marketplace recently. And for me, I look at those flavored water in this and I think, gosh, I, I want more flavor. Like I get the idea that it's sparkling with like a little bit of an essence, but I really want flavor. Uh, and so I still feel like there's a need in the market for consumers who want real flavor, not just the essence of something, um, but a nice, strong, flavorful product without all the sugar or artificial ingredients that, that typically sodas have had in the past or um, high sugar juices. Yeah, I really love the fact that it wasn't too sweet and it goes a little bit healthier by drinking it. Um, I know it's not as good as water, maybe, but I did get that vitamin C, so I love that. Um, well, the, ni the nice thing is we do get a lot of adults drinking it. You know, ideally, it's positioned to kids as a replacement for things like Capri Sun or Honest Kids juice boxes. But reality is that we get a lot of adults saying, hey, you know, I don't have kids at all, and I love it. So the more the merrier. Whoever drinks it, the, be the better. Yeah. And how did you decide on the six ounces for the, the pouches? Oh, that's really more of a manufacturing thing. You know, so sometimes it's just easier to work with the sizes that a manufacturer currently runs than to try to create your own unique size. So for for us, you know, six ounces, you know, it's a small enough size that 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 kids will drink it and not waste it. You know, the last thing you want is to buy buy pouches and the kids drink half of it and leave the rest and it gets sticky and gross and spills out all over the place. So, you know, it's trying to trying to hit the um, the, the right spot in terms of the best size for the consumer. And, and you have some uh, personal market research candidates, users uh, in your home. So I'm sure that factored into the decision making process as well. That's right. That's exactly it. And it's funny. I mean, one of the things that the complaints that we hear, and this is not just for our pouches, it's, I hear it across the industry. Parents have a really tough time putting straws into those juice pouches for whatever reason. I find it very easy, but... You know, a big, and but to your point, because I have kids and because I'm at home using these juice boxes and I've, I've, I know, I know the right method that it works every time. So I actually am posting, I don't know if I'm posting today or tomorrow, a video to our social media to show, you know, the right way to open a, um, the, to open, a, open a juice pouch. So it's, uh, it's very easy once you know sort of the, the tips and tricks. Yeah. I like, like you, I have a background in craft. And so at the time you were making Capri Sun. And I would go to the craft store and get the little juice boxes. So I learned then. But I do have to say, it's hard to do it in the dark. In the dark. <laughs> yeah, pro I, I can understand that. <laughs> I remember when we first met, you told me the product contained Arona berries. And I was curious when I bought it to see if it was still an ingredient. It looks like it's still in the product. Can you tell us a little bit about what that ingredient is and why you added it? Yeah, so um, we used aronia berries or use aronia berries as you know to give it an extra boost of antioxidants. It gives a beautiful pink color. You'll notice the packaging is very pink. Um, I always wear pink, as you know. You've never seen me one day without when I'm not wearing uh, when I'm doing business. But I'm always wearing pink. And aronia berries that grow in the Midwest, they um, uh, and we they're they're a native berry to the Midwest. They're indigenous here. One of the highest antioxidant fruits in the world. And I learned about them and thought, how cool would that be to incorporate them into the product? So, I, I from a communications perspective, I spoke about it in a, in a stronger way early on. At this point, we really just use it more for color. And we source our aronia from either the Midwest or from um, Eastern Europe. Now grows it as well. So, frankly, wherever we can get the best supply. Mm. Okay. Alrighty. And so um, earlier you were saying your target audience are kids. Why did you make that decision to focus mostly on kids? Well, the kids, the kids is really on the pouches, right? So on the, on these lemonade pouches is really the who, who the target is. Again, we do get consumers who, um, who are adults who drink it as well, which is great. But you know, when my hope is that we will reintroduce those bottles again and we'll go back into marketing to more of the all family occasion or to adults as well. So right now it's it's kids because of the product format, 
being very similar to Capri Sun, and then uh, eventually we'll we'll innovate into other beverage categories too. Yeah, and I'm sure you have your hands full with all the expansion that you mentioned earlier. No doubt, no doubt. We've got Target, we've got Walmart. Uh, here in Chicago, we've got Jewel and Mariano's, Pete's Fresh Market, and then on the East Coast, Stop and Shop, um, Lowe's in the Southeast, and then a whole bunch of Albertsons divisions in uh, in the in, in the South Central region. So it's been an exciting year, no doubt. Nice. So you mentioned that you had a traditional corporate career, but you were inspired to do more. So can you tell us what makes you feel inspired or to be your best self? Oh, you know, it's honestly, it's, it's just the daily challenge. And, you know, once you start a, once you start a business, you kind of get addicted to it and it's hard to turn it off, right? Like even on those days you're like, oh, you know, you're having, you're having a bad day. Like reality is this is the business and it's running and I have to run it. And if I don't, there is no one else to do it for me, right? So you have investors that you are beholden to and you have to do the right thing by them. Um, and and I'm still excited by the prospect of where this business can go. Um, I get very motivated by it. And um, it's fantastic when consumers, um, you know, send in compliments or questions and they've noticed you or they, there's a little shout out on social media that someone found your product and they want to talk about it. And it's, uh, it's exciting for what the prospect could hold. So, so for that reason, I'm, I'm still plugging away. Yeah, um, it, it has to be inspiring, especially when you hear from customers. So is there a favorite customer story that you have that you can tell us about? Oh, gosh. I actually don't know if I have a favorite customer story. I feel bad. I feel like I should have something really fun and cool. I'll probably think of it as soon as this podcast ends. All right. Well, shoot us a message and we'll include it in our show notes. But I'm sure you're going out there. So if you could turn back time and talk to your pre-entrepreneur self, what would you tell yourself? Oh, gosh. You want to say that's a hard one. I've definitely made mistakes for sure, but I don't know that those mistakes are things that I should have known about ahead of time, you know, that I should have said, well, if I had known differently, I would have done, done it a different way. I think sometimes mistakes are, are, are helpful. They're humbling. They force you to think and to pivot. And yeah, so from that perspective, I think I think you just kind of have to have to roll with the punches as, as an entrepreneur. You know, people always warn me you're going to need more money than you ever think. That's probably true. You know, you, the, the people warn me about the blood, sweat, and tears, and that all is true as well. I think you just have to have the fortitude to know that to know that things will happen. As they come, some startups move very quickly and some take a lot longer. The majority take a lot longer. In fact, the majority actually fail, right? And then, and then the second group is the brands that take a long time to all of a sudden hit their stride. And then every now and then you'll get a brand that takes off out of the gate, but that's very rare. And so I think an important advice to anyone entering this world of entrepreneurship and food and beverage just really needs to know that this is not a one or two year gig. Um, this is a, a real commitment that can take many years and, and you can't just give up after a year or two, especially when you've taken investor money, you've got to see it through to the end. Right. And so you mentioned that some companies, they are successful right at the gate, some take a little bit longer. What do you attribute your success to? to? It seems like you're, you've been doing pretty well. You mentioned that this is a really strong year for you. Do you think it was luck or what do you attribute your, your success? Well, don't forget, this is a strong year for me in 2021, but I started the business in 2017. So, you know, we're four years in at this point. So things take time to learn what works and what doesn't work. In terms of attributing uh, attributing success, you know, it's it's believing in your product and um, pivoting when things aren't working and, and learning from those mistakes and making changes quickly. And, you know, not, I hate to say it, but not hiring a huge team. You know, there's things that I can do and I can do them well. I may be stressed, you know, stretched for time, but the capital that I've brought in, I really want to go towards the business and not just to add on personnel to do things that I could otherwise do myself. So a lot of it is, um, is, is, is that personal endeavor, that personal hard work. Mm -hmm. And so you mentioned um, pivoting quite a bit. And I know it's, sometimes it's hard because your business is almost like a second child or third child, your baby. So what do you advise entrepreneurs in terms of making the decision to pivot? How, when should they do it? How should they approach that? As quickly as possible. I, you know, there are bottles did fine, but I, it was the, it was the pouches that really took off. And I kept the bottles going for another year beyond that. And I probably should have 
should have turned off the bottles quicker just so that I could focus the resources that I had on the pouches. And so, you know, from a pivot perspective, I I'd thought about pivoting for many, many, many months before I actually did it. Had I done it sooner, it would have benefited the business more. It would have focused my resources and my time on the product line that, that had the best potential. So yeah, I would have, in terms of pivoting, once you get the inkling, it's probably the right move and you got to go quickly. Yeah. And so I do want to also ask you about your approach to marketing. How, how do you approach marketing? You have a marketing background. I'm sure it's very interesting, your approach. Marketing has changed you one day. In the years since I was a brand manager at those big consumer packaged goods companies, um, marketing has changed in the world of startups. It's all, as you know, online. It's all, I should take, I take that back, it's online and in-store, right? So if you have a direct-to-consumer business, it really is all online. For us, we're still predominantly a retail business, but to reach consumers, we're using we're using social. So, you know, the money goes into geo-targeted social media ads that we're targeting towards the type of consumer that we think is most apt to purchase Populu in those in those retailers. And we do a lot of influencer marketing and then we spend money in store um, at the point of purchase where consumers, you know, we want to make sure consumers find the product, are compelled to purchase it, even if it's at a trial driving price, like a like a, a price reduction like you tried at Populu on. So that's where the money goes. Those are those are the main marketing tactics on a lean budget. Hmm. So it sounds sounds appropriate, <laughs> and I'm glad you were able to again pivot uh, into the digital space, but still leverage your other background, your previous background. So congratulations! Also, I wanted to talk to you about how important is media coverage. I did see that you were recently on ABC Chicago, I believe, and then also I've seen that you've been in the Chicago Tribune and Food Navigator USA. How important has this coverage been for your business? Um, you know, PR is, is a great tool. It's relatively inexpensive and it gives you some nice, nice wins. It's important for investors to see. It's important for the trade to see the people who work in the beverage business. Um, are consumers really reading it? Maybe a little bit. But I think it's more. I think it's more investors and in trade that really benefit the most from um, from seeing press coverage. But listen, the more you can get, the better. And it never it never hurts to reach out to those journalists and and try to get them to write about you. Wow. So are you reaching out on your own, or do you have any support in that area? Um, this year, we're not doing much in the way of of press outreach, just to with with limited budgets. So before you were doing it, but you actually, did you have a PR person? Is that why? Yeah, we had, we put a little more effort into PR in previous years. But at this point, you know, when you're no longer a new product, there's a little less to talk about, right? So you can't go to journalists and say, hey, we've got a new product. Well, in reality, it's a year old. So, so the, the newsworthiness goes down and you have to find other angles to, to pitch. Okay. So it sounds like lots going on. You've mastered some areas and are still growing in others. I'm like um, impressed that you're doing all of this and you have a really lean team. Uh, I guess what I was wondering is when do you pull that trigger and start growing your team? Um, when I feel that I either do not have the bandwidth myself or I do not have the skill set to get it done. You know, there are certain specialties, including performance marketing, that I don't know how to do, right? And I'm not going to try to pretend to do it because it's going gonna, it's gonna to kill me on time and I'm going to get crappy results. So those are the types of things that you say, all right, time to outsource and, and, and get a real expert in here. And you do it when you have the money, right? So um, hope we'll be doing a capital raise in a couple of weeks. We'll be starting and hopefully we'll bring in some money and be able to expand the team and expand the business. So how, how are you approaching um, fundraising? I spoke with another entrepreneur last month. He was mentioning all the crowdsourcing platforms that are out there now and the raise money. Are you using any of those or are you using the traditional routes? Yeah, we're going to be using uh, using a crowdsourced, uh, a crowdfunding site. And, you know, that will be the, a great way to be able to reach angel investors because when you're still the small size that we are, you know, venture capitalists 
aren't interested in you, private equity isn't interested, the money really is going to come um, from angel investors. And and um, Republic and crowdfunding sites like that allow us to reach the everyday consumer who may only have 100 or $150 to put into the business. They're not an accredited investor, but they're still interested in the in the, in the company and, and want a piece of the action. And that's one way that, that that we can reach more more investors at smaller check sizes, which I think is going to uh, benefit us in the short term in our capital raise. Nice. So I, I have the opportunity to own some Apopaloo. That's right. You want a piece of this? That's, how they, how That's what I'm saying. I, I believe in Melody, so I'm going to have to do my oh. dinner in a row. <laughs> You're sweet. You're sweet. So just wondering, are I, I started thinking about craft days and the consumption analysis. And I was just wondering, do you do any of that? Like understanding like what's no. going on? No, I don't do that because I don't have the I don't have that level of, of data anyway. Even if I even if I had the time, I don't have the level of data. But I think, you know, in the big companies you learn to really know how to mine data. And of course it's helpful. But as an entrepreneur, you don't have the access to the data. You don't have the um, the funds to be able to pay for that data. And you really have to use a lot of intuition. You have to be out in the marketplace and looking at the shelves and seeing what's moving and what's not. You know, are, are we out of stock here? Have we sold, you know, if I go into a store and I see one one unit left on the shelf, I say, all right, cool. We've sold sold some product here. If I see the shelves are fully stocked, I say, all right, got a problem. You know, it's, and so a lot of it is using the resources you have, going to visit stores, making your calls, talking to the your buyers at the major retailers and say, how am I doing? Um, and that information is just as helpful, even if it's not exactly as, as analytical and numbers oriented as the big um, consumer packaged goods I have access to. Yeah, that makes sense. You have to hit the ground and and do it, but do a little bit more late work, but you still get the same information. That's right. That's right. So I want to ask you, also ask you, we talked about a lot. What is the number one takeaway you want our audience to know about you, Kapalu, be an entrepreneur? What should they leave the table with? Oh, gosh. It's just, you know, to do this job takes a tremendous amount of perseverance. This is not easy for people who think, who look at these food and beverage entrepreneurs and say, oh, that doesn't look too hard. It is. It is hard. It is um, It is incredibly time intensive. It requires a very broad skill set, unless you have a lot of partners that you're working with that bring their own skill sets into it. But it can also be a lot of fun. There's a great, great feeling of accomplishment when you've, when you've achieved even just a small amount of success. I agree. Now, with all your balls in the air and doing a lot of on your own for Papalu, how do you take time off and rejuvenate? I spend a lot of time outside. We walk, we walk our dog about six miles a day. We do a lot of bike rides. I'm always outside, no matter no matter the time of year, and that's uh, it's uh, good for my mental health. That's that sounds awesome. And so I want to end and ask you, what's next for Papalu? Right now, I'm I'm keeping focus on the pouches. I don't want to yeah I don't want to think too far next because I'll get distracted from what's most important. So right now and for for the you know for the next year at least it's going to be sole focus on pouches, driving velocity at the retailers we're in, picking up some new retailers, and uh, and yeah that's that's the goal. Yeah, and you're probably in a really good position too because next year's kids will be going back to school. They need to pack their lunches, and so it's a good That's opportunity right. to really promote that time of year. That's exactly it. Exactly. Well, thanks again, Melanie, for joining us. Thanks, Yuwandi, for having me on, and hopefully we'll we'll see each other again before another four years has passed. <laughs> I agree. I agree. Well, take care. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs>